Okay, it looks like everyone is here. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome to our Survive and Thrive webinar series. Um, we are so glad that you joined us today and we are very thankful to have Dr. Wasserman leading our discussion on pain management within the clinical continuum of cancer pain. Um, just to remind everybody, um, about our foundation. We are the Texas Oncology Foundation and we are dedicated to supporting uh, cancer patients in the communities where they live, work, and receive treatment. Um, some of our programs are like this. Um, they are all within our Survive and Thrive um, realm. And so this is where we get to do educational events, community um, connections, and we get to provide resources just to support not only the patient, but their families and loved ones um, in that cancer journey. I do wanna remind everybody that we are on Zoom webinar today. And so you can see and hear us, but we cannot see or hear you. So again, utilize that chat. That's gonna be our main form of communicating with you all today. Um, if you are experiencing technical difficulties, sometimes the best solution is just to quickly exit and then rejoin, and that'll typically fix itself. Um, if you're having trouble with audio, a good solution is to call in rather than using your computer audio, and that is um, by your mute button. There's a little arrow that points up. You can click on that and switch to phone. Um, if you do have questions throughout Dr. Wasserman's presentation, again, utilize that chat, send us in your thoughts, your comments, your questions, and um, we're not going to interrupt him, but at the end of his presentation, well, we will have a Q&A and we will get to all of your um, questions that you have for him. Lastly, this webinar is going to be recorded. Um, you will be shared a copy of it and it will be housed on our foundation website for you. Um, so if you miss anything or want to revisit some of the information, we will have that available to you. Dr. Wasserman, thank you so much for being here today. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on him, he specializes in interventional pain management, and he is at our Texas Oncology Baylor Salmon's Cancer Center up in the Dallas area. Um, we are very eager to hear from you, and just thank you for being here today and spending your time with us. Thank you, Kelly, and it's uh, my pleasure to be here. Uh, I am Jeff Wasserman. I'm an interventional pain physician. I'm a board certified in anesthesia and uh, interventional pain. Um, offices in Dallas, here at Salmon's, at the Carroll Clinic, and also in Rockwall. Uh, my talk today is going to be on pain management and the cancer treatment uh, uh, within the clinical continuum. First, let's go over uh, some, some data. And the good news is that cancer patients are living longer uh, than they used to. So, uh, the last Data from 2019 in the American Cancer Society showed that the cancer rate for all tumors fell 32% from the peak in 1991. In the UK, there's some data that showed uh, survival had increased uh, five to six fold from 1971 through 2011, which was rather dramatic. Why is this happening? Well, uh, improved screening and early uh, cancer detection methods are now available. Uh, newer treatment options such as immunotherapy and targeted gene therapies are coming out and on the horizon and means of delivering more traditional approaches such as chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery have improved uh, markedly as well. Uh, as far as cancer pain goes, uh, with the increased survival, this is becoming more uh, predominant a problem. 40% of all cancer patients at any time will have chronic pain and up to 70% of those with advanced or terminal cancer will be reporting pain. Of those patients who do have pain, 60 to 70% of the pain will be due to a direct effect of the tumor itself, either a destruction or compression of tissues. Uh, chemotherapy, radiation therapy may cause pain. For example, a lot of patients who are on cisplatin or oxaliplatin therapy will develop peripheral neuropathy, and that can persist even beyond the duration of the chemotherapy for several years. And the pain may be related to things having nothing to do with the neoplasm, but perhaps due to the impairment such as back pain, migraines, et cetera. Uh, even though most cancer pain will respond to traditional therapies such as chemo, radiation therapy, or opiates and other painkillers, 25 to 30% of terminal cancer patients reportedly die without relief from severe pain. 
So for individuals such as these or anybody recalcitrant to therapy, that's what folks like me are here for. Uh, we just do different techniques and have different knowledge of medications that can prove very useful. So what is an interventional pain medicine physician? Well, we're board certified in our primary specialty, such as anesthesia, physiatry, or interventional radiology. And we obtain added fellowship training in the use of all the modalities used to treat chronic pain, such as medications, use of rehabilitation, injections, which is what, what I'm uh, specifically a specialist in and using implants. Uh, everything we do is with fluoroscopy and ultrasound guided. Uh, we use neuromodulation, such as peripheral and spinal cord stimulation, ablative procedures to destroy tumors and other tissue uh, when called for, uh, cementing procedures of the spine and within the long bones for metastatic cancer, and implantable devices such as uh, opiate infusion pumps, which I'll discuss later on. And why are anesthesiologists doing this? Most interventional pain physicians are anesthesiologists. And that's just because we have a lot of experience in our training. We're doing spine injections, such as spinals and epidurals in the operating room and outside the operating room. Uh, we're used to using large dose opiates, especially in cardiac surgery. So this is kind of a natural transition for us to do this. Uh, going back to cancer pain, uh, the definition, it's a chronic pain condition associated with cancer, often presents with several different types of pain, and we'll talk about the different types of pain. And that's important because different types of pain respond to different modalities. Uh, the main treatment goal is to improve quality of life and re reduce pain and functioning. The goal isn't to get 100% pain relief. Uh, I'm never 100% pain. <laughs> pain-free in my day, and certainly cancer patients won't be either, but the goal is to improve quality of life overall. So let's get into a little bit more details, and I promise if anything looks overwhelming, I'll try to illustrate it, and I'll go into details and, and explain it all. So there are different types of pain, as we discussed. The two main types are nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain. Nociceptive, meaning it's pain transmitted by specialized nerves in the body, and there's two main types of those. There's the alpha, delta, and C nociceptors. And the alpha, delta nerves transmit that initial sharp sensation of pain. So for example, if you break a bone in your arm, you'll have that initial sharp pain, and then you'll get that dull aching pain that follows. And that initial sharp pain, which makes you withdrawal and, and is useful in a sense. If you hit, put your hand on a stove, you'll immediately pull it away. Those A delta fibers, they have fat insulation around them. They transmit their signals very fast. The C fibers do not have insulation. They're what's called unmyelinated fibers. Uh, then neuropathic pain, that's described often as burning, shooting, electric-like, and that's due to damage to nerves themselves. And so you may get numbness, tingling, and weakness along with it. And common examples of those would be neuropathy, like peripheral neuropathy, shingles. If you've ever had that, you know how painful that is and the burning quality to that sciatica or radiculopathy in the legs or arms, and carpal tunnel syndrome is a, is a type of neuropathic pain due to compression of the median nerve at the wrist. So let's look at these two in more detail, nociceptive pain, and uh, that may, that's broken down into two different types as well, somatic meaning from most of the body or visceral coming from the organs of the body. It results from mechanical, thermal, or chemical excitation of these specialized nerves and nociceptors and they're found throughout the body. And they transmit the sensation of pain all the way up to your central nervous system where you perceive the pain. Uh, episodes of initial sharp pain, as we talked about, are transmitted by those A delta fibers, followed by that dull aching pain, the C fibers. Now, the organs of your body, visceral pain, they don't really have A delta fibers. They have almost all C fibers. So when you have, for example, an ulcer or something coming from your organs, you don't get that sharp pain as much as you do that dull, aching, gnawing type of pain, and that comes from those C fibers. Now, all these types of pain that are no susceptive pain usually respond to opiates, so that's very useful. And opiates block the transmission of pain within the central nervous system, and we'll look at that in a little bit more detail. So here's an illustration of how pain is transmitted from the body. So let's say you've got an injury to the hand, and the signal goes all the way up a single nerve in reality, it's multiple nerves that will transmit it, but we're going to just look at one nerve here. And it goes all the way up to the spinal cord where it then gets transmitted to a second nerve up to the brain where you perceive the pain. 
And looking at that in a little bit more detail, here are those C and A delta fibers going into the back of your spinal cord and they enter an area called the dorsal horn. And then it's through chemicals released by this first nerve it goes over to the secondary neurons that are in what's called the spinal thalamic tract. It crosses over your spinal cord and then it goes up to your brain where you perceive it as pain. Now, when we use opiates, for example, we're blocking the transmission of pain right here, usually right in the substantia gelatinosa of that dorsal horn. And also in other parts of the nervous system, there are receptors for the opiates. But opiates aren't working out here in your hand where the, where the injury initially happened it's actually blocking the pain signal here in the central nervous system. Looking at it again diagrammatically, here's another illustration where we have, this is supposed to be the periphery, such as your arm or your hand. Here's that single nerve with its cell body lying outside, just outside the spinal column. Here's that single nerve going to that dorsal horn of the spinal cord, sends its signal to that second nerve that then goes, crosses over the spinal cord and goes up to the brain. Now, when you get pain, you don't just get ouch, like you're a robot. There's more of an emotional component. There's an ouch to it. And those are nerves from other systems, such as the reticular thalamic tract, which get stimulated and transmit that emotional suffering component of pain as well. Now, fortunately, we have uh, nerve pathways in our body that help to modulate pain, and that's called the modulatory system. And uh, you have natural uh, opioids in your body, such as enkephalins and endorphins, that stimulate this nerve pathway and actually block the transmission of pain in your body. Uh, antidepressants, certain ones, such as Cymbalta uh, or Elevil, amitriptyline, will actually help to increase the activity of this modulatory system, which is why some antidepressants can be very useful for chronic pain. So neuropathic pain, again, that results from actual damage to nerves or the insulation of nerves called the myelin sheath or altered function of the nerves. And we gave, we talked about examples of those. Injured nerves may fire spontaneously. They become a pacemaker for pain, if you will. So uh, the pain can be spontaneous and continuous uh, from nerve damage pain. Uh, it tends to be opiate resistant, or at the very least, you need higher doses of opiates. It's just the nature of the, this type of pain. And we need to use other types of medications, such as anticonvulsants or antidepressants, which we'll discuss. And again, one way we diagnose neuropathic pain and distinguish it from somatic pain is it may be described as burning, tingling, shooting, or electric light. And you may get numbness, tingling, or weakness associated with it as well. So here we have a normal nerve with cell body sits outside um, the spinal column in most cases, if it's the arm or the leg, for example. Here is that myelin coating. It acts like an insulator, so it helps to transmit the electrical signal faster through the nerve. Nerve pain can come from compression of the nerve, such as in carpal tunnel syndrome. And this, this area of the nerve will start to fire spontaneously due to the injury. You may lose that myelin sheath, that myelin coating that happens in uh, multiple sclerosis and HIV uh, um, uh, neuropathy and in diabetic neuropathy that can occur. You can have direct injury to the nerve and cutting of nerve, or you can have degeneration and some chronic disease. And these all can lead to neuropathic pain, as can cancer, where we're getting just direct destruction of the nerve uh, or compression of the nerve. So let's go into treatments now. And the first line treatments, uh, just like any other pain, will often be over-the-counter medications like anti-inflammatories, ibuprofen, naproxen, Tylenol. Uh, prescription drugs, there are prescription anti-inflammatories like Celebrex or Meloxicam. Creams like capsation or local anesthetic creams. Uh, Quitenza patch we use uh, for some uh, neuropathies. Muscle relaxants. Adjuvant medications or medications that were developed for other purposes, such as anti, antidepressants or medications for seizures, anticonvulsants, well, those can be very useful for nerve damage pain. Clonidine is a medication developed for high blood pressure that can also be used uh, for pain control. It's called an alpha-2 agonist. And then opiates, and opiates bind to the opioid receptors found throughout the body, but the ones that do the most good for our purposes are found within the spinal cord and the brain, the central nervous system. They can be short or long acting. However, they do have their risks. They have side effects. 
And you can develop tolerance, dependency, and addiction. Now, addiction is something people worry about, but it's very rare. Those are people who use their medications for non-medical purposes. And we don't see that very often for chronic pain, but we do see tolerance and dependency. Those are things you just can't avoid. So how do opioids work since uh, we talk about opiates a lot? Now, opiates and opioids, they're not quite the same, but we're gonna use them interchangeably. Op opiates are derived directly in nature from poppy seeds, et cetera. Opioids may be artificial developed in uh, the uh, pharmaceutical companies, but for our purposes, they work the same. They bind to receptors within the central nervous system. And this just kind of diagrammatically shows you morphine binding to its receptor that leads to uh, changes in the nerve that's involved, uh, which will help to uh, reduce pain. And again, these receptors, the mu receptors, especially the ones we're interested in, are found within the central nervous system. There are some opiate receptors found elsewhere throughout the body, and that's why you may that's why you may get constipation as a side effect, et cetera. But for pain control, the ones we're concerned about are in the central nervous system. Uh, physical therapy, rehabilitation, and uh, mental health counseling, we use these as well, uh, especially when there's weakness or deconditioning. Physical therapy can be very useful to improve strength and balance uh, and improve functioning. Chiropractics, we will refer to chiropractors when we need to. Uh, acupuncture, I'm a believer in it. Unfortunately, it tends to be short term, so you need to keep going over and over again. Uh, relaxation techniques such as biofeedback, yoga can be useful, and mental health counseling. Patients with chronic pain, not just cancer pain, but any chronic pain, uh, have been shown to be more likely to suffer from depression, anxiety, and hypochondriasis. So that needs to be treated as well. Now let's go into the minimally invasive procedures that uh, uh, we do for interventions. Uh, injection therapy, trigger points, which go into kind of tender areas of muscle that go into contraction. Uh, for example, if you sleep and you wake up with, a, with a, a crank in your neck, that's basically what that is, is a trigger point. It's an area of muscle that goes into such intense spasm, it cuts off its own blood flow. Metabolites like lactic acid build up in the muscle and you get this vicious circle mechanism started. And if you can inject it with some local anesthetic steroid, even putting a needle in it called dry needling can help to uh, reduce that spasm. And again, we do all of our injections with ultrasound when we're doing joints. Uh, nerve blocks we'll do under fluoroscopy, uh, uh, spine injections um, we do commonly in the operating room with fluoroscopy and sedation, and we do neurolytic injections as well with medications like phenol, alcohol, or use radiofrequency heat to destroy nerves uh, when that's amenable. Uh, vertebral cementing, uh, the spine is the most common area for bone metastasis, lung, breast, and other tumors uh, like kidney tumors tend to go to the spine. Uh, whether or not there's a fracture or not, just having the tumor present will destroy the bone and lead to instability. And what we can do for these uh, tumors is do a procedure called kyphoplasty where we place a balloon into it, blow up the balloon, which restores the height of the fractured vertebra, creates a cavity that we can then fill with cement that restores function and reduces pain. Uh, we can also sometimes go in there first, destroy the lesion. This is a procedure called osteocool, where we place needles into the uh, metastatic lesion, destroy the tumor, then fill it with bone and uh, increase the stability and reduce pain that way. Uh, this is just a close-up of a trigger point injection, putting needle into that intense area of uh, contraction of the muscle. This is a joint injection done with ultrasound. You can see the needle coming in here. This actually is a shoulder injection. Uh, this is uh, someone with a, a rotator cuff tendonitis. The needle's going in and we're injecting it under continuous guidance here. That we can usually just do in the office without sedation. That's pretty easy to do. Uh, steroid injections into the spine will do for people with herniated discs, but sometimes with tumor as well, when there's nerve compression going on. Uh, here's a fluoroscopy view of a needle going in and injecting contrast around the nerve. You can see nerves under x-ray, but by putting in the contrast, we can actually see the nerve here encased by the contrast. Uh, other nerve blocks we'll do in the neck. These, these are, this is called a sympathetic nerve block. We'll do for pain in the face or the arm. Uh, we do nerve blocks for the leg as well. And for organs, such as the pancreas, we'll do a block called a celiac plexus block. We'll, we'll sedate the patient, numb up the skin place a needle under fluoroscopic guidance or uh, CAT scans can be used to guide this as well uh, to place either a local anesthetic or a, a, a alcohol 
if we want to get a long acting effect from it. Uh, this just shows for neurolytic procedures, uh, burning some nerves using needles when we can, or placing a needle and injecting alcohol around a uh, nerve such as the celiac plexus that we do for pancreatic cancer. Uh, implantable devices. Um, this is kind of our specialty. I'm currently kind of a tertiary care physician. We see the ones that have seen other physicians and haven't been able to get relief and they end up at our clinic. Um, neurostimulation is using electrodes uh, to place an electrical field over peripheral nerve or the spinal cord and blocking the transmission of pain to the central nervous system. Uh, we can also implant pumps uh, with catheters, the pumps will be underneath the skin of the abdomen. The catheter runs underneath the skin into the spinal canal where you can inject uh, an opiate, for example, directly into spinal fluid where it's almost 300 times more potent and has much less side effects than using oral opiates. And we'll talk more about that in a second. So first, spinal cord stimulation. Uh, here we see electrodes or leads placed over the spinal cord within the spinal canal which will block the transmission of pain going up the spinal cord to the brain and also blocks incoming signals from nerves at that location of the spinal canal as well. So it can be very effective. We use them for chronic pain for sciatica that doesn't respond to other treatments, uh, uh, neuropathy, uh, anything that involves pain uh, throughout, the, basically below the neck, these can be very successful for it. Uh, we'll do a trial first where we place electrodes into the spine put a little, no incision gets made for this, by the way, put a little bandage over the skin, uh, hook it up to an external battery pack the patient wears, goes home for a week, goes about their business and tries this out. See if it works well. About a week later, they return to see us. We take off the dressing, remove the lead, put a bandaid at the skin and they're done. And if they've gotten at least 75% pain relief and better functioning, then they'll go to implantation. That only takes about an hour to do as an outpatient. We do make some small incisions, uh, but only about an inch deep to get sterile leads under the skin with a little battery. Looks like a little pacemaker that goes underneath the upper buttock about one or two inches or so. Uh, this is what the systems look like. These are the leads that go into the spine. This is the battery. It's quite small. This is enlarged actually just for this illustration, but this is only about five millimeters thick and about a couple inches uh, lengthwise. And this is the charging device that every, every couple of days or so, the patient will have to put this over their skin, sends a magnetic signal to the battery and recharges it. Sometimes we'll put in a battery that doesn't require recharging, but that tends to last three to four years, needs to be replaced. These rechargeable batteries will last about 10 years or so. And the patient does have a controller. They can turn the device on or off. For example, they may not need it at night while they're sleeping. So to save battery life, they may turn it off at night. They can go between different programs. Uh, some programs work better than others, and they can even change the strength of the program. That's all under the patient's control. Uh, intrathecal infusion therapy. These are for patients who just have not responded to anything uh, less invasive. And we do a trial of this as well. We'll put an epidural catheter in somebody that's the same type of catheter we put in women for childbirth, for example. Uh, They'll go home with an external pump that infuses, for example, morphine into the spine at less than a milligram a day usually to see what it does for their pain. And if it's successful, we can implant the pump. Um, these pumps are about half the size of a hockey puck if you wanna look at it, you know, comparatively speaking, they're thinner than a hockey puck. They go underneath the skin of the abdomen and the catheter runs underneath the skin all the way into the spinal canal. The implantation procedure is also an outpatient procedure, it takes about an hour and a half to do. And the advantages of these pumps, uh, if let's say a patient is taking 300 milligrams per day of uh, opiate such as morphine, uh, the equivalent to that is intravenous morphine about 100 milligrams per day. And intravenous drugs are about three times more potent than their oral form. When we deliver it directly into spinal fluid, it's 300 times more potent than the pills. We only have to give about a milligram a day. So very little of that gets uh, absorbed throughout the rest of the body. So we get less constipation, less nausea, less sedation, and it's much more effective as well. And we can use many other medications in these pumps. We don't just use morphine, we can use hydromorphone, we can use fentanyl, other opiates. We can use a local anesthetic, bupivacaine in the pump, especially if there's neuropathy or, or nerve damage involved. And we can put clonidine, that uh, antihypertensive medication I discussed, 
we can put those into pumps as well. A uh, baclofen, which is a muscle relaxant uh, we can use in these pumps, especially for people with a lot of spasm with their pain. Uh, as you can see, these are studies that show how effective these, pu these pumps have been. This has shown effectiveness on a scale from zero to 100. And these studies have all shown 60 to high 90% uh, pain relief in cancer patients and other uh, chronic pain conditions. And if you look at the years of these studies, 1986, 1999, 80s and 90s, these pumps have been around for uh, 40, 50 years. I've been putting them in personally for 25 years. And I can tell you they haven't really changed much. They've got a little smaller, but uh, they're basically the same thing as we've been doing since the 90s. And just to reiterate the goal, it's to improve quality of life. We want to get people functioning and let them enjoy their days as much as possible. And with that, I will open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Wasserman. Well, we have quite a few that came in, so I'm just going to start feeding you questions and attendees, if you have more that arise during this conversation, continue to use that chat and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, okay, so one attendee said she has ovarian cancer. Um, I had developed joint pain and I'm not sure if it's from the chemo or the cancer. I currently take hydroconin at 8 a.m. and one at 3 p.m. It doesn't, it doesn't take all the pain, but it makes it tolerable. Is there, are there more options out there for overall pain? For all over pain, sorry. Yes, there, 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 uh, there certainly is. I mean, there's long acting opiates. I mean, she's taken hydrocodone, that's a short acting opiate for one thing. And the problem is when you take a short acting opiate, you're kind of doing this roller coaster ride throughout the day. The pill reaches its maximal effect in one to two hours and wears off by three to four hours. Um, so you can either take more of that short acting opiate, which we prefer not to do, or perhaps add a low dose long acting opiate. So instead of doing this throughout the day, we kind of smooth things out and not have the big bumps. We'll still add a short acting medication to use for breakthrough pain to a low dose long acting opiate, uh, but there's many options. In addition to opiates, there's other options as well. The antidepressants we talked about, uh, anticonvulsants like gabapentin, Lyrica aren't just used for nerve damage pain, they're used for even somatic pain. They'll work very well too. So many options there, mm -hmm. many options there. Uh, that's what we're here for. Yeah, um, I mean, to your point, there are many options and your entire presentation, we went through handfuls of options. How do you suggest people start when it comes to their pain management? When do you suggest, like, at what point does pain become needing pain management and where do they start to look to find what options would work best for them? Uh, good question. Well, I, again, most people will respond to the traditional therapies, either over-the-counter or prescription anti-inflammatories or low-dose opiates. And, you know, we're, we're happy to see anybody and we're here for anybody. But when people are not responding to things that their primary care doctors or their oncologists are giving them, when the usual things aren't working, that's when they need to be referred to a pain medicine physician. We just have more, more tools in our bag, mm -hmm. and, and we just have more experience treating the pain. And the oncologists often are busy, you know, uh, uh, developing the, the strategy for chemotherapy or radiation therapy, mm -hmm. and they're treating the pain, but that's not their focus. But we're here just to focus on that and to help the clinical care team to be as consultants. Uh, we don't want to take over the care. We're just here to help. So if it doesn't respond to the usual therapies, that's when, uh, you know, the person should ask to be referred to a pain specialist. That's good. Um, we had a question come in about the pumps. Um, how are these refilled? The pumps. Uh, so they're refilled in the office, actually. Uh, typically, the pump uh, is about 20 milliliters, 20 cc's. And the entire pump is basically a reservoir. The actual computer and gears are literally that small in the pump. It's uh, tear shaped and the top of the pump is all the mechanism. The rest of the pump, the, the, the circular portion of the tear is just a 20 milliliter reservoir. And because it's only delivering usually about 0.3 to 0.2 cc's or milliliters a day, uh, any refill will last about three months. 
person comes into our office, we just clean off the skin over the abdomen. We have a little template that fits over the pump. We place a needle through the skin about an inch or so, and it goes into the pump and we refill it and we're done. It literally takes 10 seconds to do. Uh, most people have no pain whatsoever when we do that. For people who are really sensitive to the needle stick, we can give them a, a lidocaine ointment that they can put on like an hour or two before they come in, but that's almost never necessary. Gotcha. Um, okay, this is a question about um, how does injections for the hips work? Are these injections under a local, I'm assuming local anesthesia is what she's asking? Yeah, that's, that's obviously a non-cancer question. It's probably arthritis, but that's what we, I mean, that's what we do all day long here. We do those in the clinic. We're using an ultrasound machine. Uh, the, the hip joint's a little bit deeper than other joints. It's a few inches deep. So we do give numbing medicine at the skin. And then we place the needle down to the joint, make the injection, and we're done. It, it takes literally about 15 seconds to do. Very quick, very simple. We can do those under fluoroscopy in the operating room as well, but they're so easily done in the clinic, that's not usually necessary. Awesome. Um, and then this uh, attendee says, I have to have a CT scan every three months. Does the pump interfere with the CT scans? Great question. It does not. Uh, it doesn't interfere with an MRI scan as well. The pumps and spinal cord stimulators now are MRI compatible. Uh, you can have CT scans with them. That has no effect. Uh, if there's an MRI scan with a pump or stimulator, we do need to see the patient back in the clinic after just so we can uh, interrogate it with our computer and be sure no, there was no reprogramming, which to be honest, I've never seen. Uh, yet we're required to tell the, the person to come back and see us and just to confirm that nothing has happened. But it's all now MRI compatible because they're made of titanium and other, uh, uh, other metals which are not uh, uh, ferromagnetic. Mm -hmm. um, what have you seen with regards to patches and medical marijuana? Uh, well, I'm a, I'm a believer in medical marijuana, first of all, but as many of you may know in Texas, uh, we still have to abide by, by state laws. Federal, the, the, the feds really aren't that interested in this from the legal perspective. It's really at the state level. In Texas, uh, medical marijuana, other than for epilepsy, unfortunately, is still not legal. Uh, hopefully, that'll change sooner than later. Um, it's certainly legal, as you know, in other states. Uh, I, am a, I am a believer in it. Whatever works, works. Um, in, in Texas, you can use CBD up to 0.5% legally. Uh, I, I do, uh, we actually have CBD oil in a lot of our clinics. We're actually dispensing them, uh, but I'm all up for getting it, trying it out. If it works, uh, so be it. They'll cost about 80 to $120 a month. Typically CBD products will, but uh, you can't put a price on, on pain relief. So I'm all for patients trying it out. Mm -hmm. And then we got a question Will physical therapy be described as well when a pump is installed? Um, or is that a case by case? It's case by case. It's not part of the protocol. Uh, and, you know, we do, we put these pumps in for people, multiple sclerosis who have spasticity. And then we are working hand in hand with a physical therapist for various reasons. But when it comes to cancer pain, and by the way, Baylor Scott and White has various uh, revital uh, 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 rehab centers specifically for cancer patients uh, throughout the Metroplex. There's like 40 throughout Dallas-Fort Worth. Uh, we, I mean, I will refer out uh, for physical therapy for pump patients if there's a lot of deconditioning. So uh, we can put the pump in and give pain relief, but if there's weakness and muscle wasting, the pump's not going to help with that. So we're still going to have to rehab the patient. So if, by all means, if there's weakness, uh, present or the patient's really impaired and now they're getting good pain relief from the pump and need to get back into it, we'll refer for physical therapy to help get them going. Okay. Um, do you know, is the pump covered by Medicare, including the inserts and refills, just insurance in general, I guess? It is. Well? It is. Uh, the pumps uh, are covered pretty much by everybody but Medicaid, but Medicare and all commercial insurance carriers do cover it. Perfect. Um, and then we got a question, sorry, I'm scrolling back up, uh, just in your experience, um, people who are going in for some more in-depth pain management, um, is chronic pain something that 
when people get to the point of coming to you, are they dealing with that for the rest of their lives or is this pain management only needed temporarily? Uh, it could be either or. Uh, most, people, most people with chronic pain and chronic pain, the definitions will, will differ, but it, it means pain associated with a chronic disease such as cancer or pain which persists beyond six to eight weeks. That's the definition of chronic pain. So I'll see patients, for example, of a herniated disc and we can treat it or even over time, it'll completely go away and it may never recur. Uh, those are the fortunate people. A lot of people with chronic pain, it's, it's a lifelong problem, whether it's from migraine headaches that are recurrent, cancer pain, or other forms of pain that just don't go away. So it's, it's both, uh, you know, uh, typically when we start seeing patients, you know, we'll be, they'll be with us for a couple of years in most cases, uh, but we, we do get some complete resolutions of pain as well. But when talking about cancer pain, that's, I don't think that's probably something you go to see, uh, but we do use, you know, radiation chemotherapy and some modalities and some people do go on and have complete uh, pain relief. And then Dr. Russellman, we did get one more question submitted. Um, can joint pain from tamoxifen be treated like these things? Um, seems minor compared to others, but still ongoing for years. Yeah, it's, it's an inflammatory issue. So likely I would try uh, putting some steroid into the joint, do an intraarticular injection first, use some prescription anti-inflammatories, and that would probably do the trick. Um. Ooh, we got two more questions, sorry. Um, I've been dealing with chronic pain for other issues for near years now, and I have added cancer pain. Um, would the pump cover all of it? Yeah, so the pump covers pain from the top of the head to the bottom of the toes, basically. Uh, spinal cord stimulation and peripheral nerve stimulation are more focal. We're gonna use that to treat kind of certain areas of the body that, that are being affected by pain, but the pumps are used. I mean, we put pumps in for neck pain, for example, uh, for chronic headaches. Sometimes we've used it for recalcitrant headaches. I mean, it can basically do everything. Not everybody's a candidate for it and not everybody responds to it. There's no panacea, but uh, they can work for diffuse pain, certainly. Awesome. And then um, what OTC meds are gentlest on the stomach? Uh, you know, I, I, ibuprofen probably is going to be for over the counter is going to be the simplest. Uh, you can always add a Pepsid or one of the, you know, uh, 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 ulcer gastritis medications to it if you're having any gastritis from it. Uh, but there's a lot of good prescription ones that are very inexpensive, easy to use, like Melox, Cam, Celebrex, which are easier on the stomach. That's the advantage to the prescription ones. But most people can tolerate ibuprofen, two to 400 milligrams uh, a couple times a day without much issues. And, and extended release uh, um, naproxen, naproxen is also tends to be pretty well tolerated. Okay. Does chronic breast pain following treatment ever go away in your experience with patients? Was that breast pain? Was that what was mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, it, it, I, what I normally would say is, look, after a couple months, if it's not after chemotherapy, radiation therapy, or I don't know if surgery was involved there, uh, post-surgical pain, but if it's not if it's not going away in a couple months, it's probably there for for long term. And then uh, we didn't go into details about it there. Once you've had this bombardment of the spinal cord from an area of pain, inflammation actually begins within the spinal cord itself. If I can go back to that slide for a second. Uh, where we show kind of the pain signals arriving at the spinal cord, right in that area right there where those pain signals arrive in the dorsal horn, all the chemicals being released by these nerves bombarding the spinal cord, you, le you, get, a, you get inflammation here in the spinal cord itself. We call that hypersensitization and windup. And so that even though things have appeared to heal out in the periphery, chronic pain continues because the spinal cord in a sense has been damaged and injured by the process. So that's when sometimes nerve blocks can be helpful or we go to the medications such as the antidepressants and the anticonvulsants. Uh, they can actually work quite well sometimes for that hypersensitivity type of pain that seems to continue even though things have healed out in the periphery. So there are many options for treatment that can be done for that. Okay. Um, 
patients referred to pain management are frequently sent to clinics that only prescribe medications under very rigid control. How do you suggest moving to a clinic like yours? Well, I mean, we, we control our, you know, for controlled substances, we do urine drug screening mm -hmm. occasionally and things like that. Depends on the patient. Usually for cancer pain, we're going to be a little bit more lax, lax with those type of things. But we, are, we do have state requirements we've got to fulfill. But we're not, uh, you know, we're not scared to write opiates like some of the primary care physicians are. We, that's what we do. We know how to do it safely. We know how to use all the different types of opiates, including some of the agonist and antagonist drugs, which have a ceiling effect and you really can't overdose with them. Uh, so uh, that shouldn't be a problem. It certainly shouldn't be a problem at, at a well-established pain clinic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I feel like that's more so what their question is, is people that are willing to work with them and explore options. Um, yeah, we. I mean, that's yeah. what we're here for. I mean, we, we do it safely. We not only... We do urine drug screening occasionally, but we also check the prescription drug monitoring program with the state. We, we check with the pharmacies. We be sure we know what medications a patient is taking. And we're here to do it right, but we're here to do it safe, safely as well. Yeah, um, but absolutely. We're not scared to do what needs to be done. Either. <laughs> yeah. Um, is long-term steroid use for pain okay? Uh, there, there's, there's a price to be paid with steroids long-term. They do have side effects, especially if we're talking about higher doses. For example, prednisone be above 10 milligrams a day. It's going to affect the, the adrenal gland. You're going to get some suppression of your, uh, of your nat body's natural steroid release, and steroids can have side effects as well, you know, fluid retention and other properties. And it can suppress your immune system. So there's some risks involved with that. Uh, so we'd always prefer other options, but if low dose steroids on a daily basis uh, does the trick and, and especially if a uh, endocrinologist is involved in the process, uh, so be it. Um, okay, these are the last two questions for you. Um, I had a double mastectomy two and a half years ago and have had chronic pain since. Um, where would you suggest I go for help with this type of pain? Uh, a pain clinic. <laughs> That's what we're here for. And, and so, I mean, there's no nerve blocks. There's no single modality that's going to work for that. I mean, personally, that would we would try different types of medications for that, uh, probably different types of medications the patient hasn't tried before. And, you know, if they didn't, if they didn't work, that's something where an intrathecal infusion uh, pump might be a good option. It depends upon how impaired the patient is. If it's a mild impairment, uh, would we go to a pump? No, but if it's a pain level above five over 10 on a daily basis and the patient just, you know, sitting around the house all day due to the severity of pain, then that's, that's when we use pumps and some of the other more advanced modalities, which we do. Mm -hmm. um, is there a time limit for how long a pump or, this, or its specific drug is working? No. No, especially now, we, we tend to use very low doses. Back 25 years ago, when I started to do these pumps, we tended to use a little bit higher doses of the opiates, for example, morphine around one to three milligrams per day. Most of my morphine pump patients now, if we're talking about morphine, are on 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams per day. We found that by microdosing, we tend to get a good pain relief, but without getting the tolerance to the medication over time. You know, tolerance means that you need more of the medication to get the same effect over time, and you can't avoid that. But the lower dose of opiate that someone is on, the less likely or the less strong, if you would, that the tolerance tends to be. Mm -hmm. Just giving you just the last moment, the last word, is there anything like your biggest, what you want people to walk away knowing today? Uh, I just want to let them know that they're certainly not alone. We talked about how common chronic pain is, especially in the cancer population. I think very few cancer patients have zero pain, just isn't, isn't something that's out there. You're not alone. Many people are there with you. Uh, you have a lot of options. And, and if uh, plan A doesn't work, I guarantee you there's a plan B, C, D, and F that, that, that might work. I think I missed E there. So, But there, there's always something out there we, that, that can be done. And, you know, if, if it's not working, please ask to be referred to a chronic pain clinic by you. See a professional who can help you with this. Awesome. Um, 
Thank you so much. This was so informative and I know everyone's gonna really love having the recording and having access to viewing your slides again. Um, you guys keep adding in the chat. If you have a question, I'll interject. Otherwise I'm gonna start wrapping us up. Everyone's just saying thank you to you so much in the chat right now. Um, thank you all for participating with us today. I know it's been a summer without our webinars and so it's good to be back. Um, in this area with you guys. Um, just a reminder, it is being recorded. We are gonna share that with you in a follow-up email. It'll be on Facebook. We'll add it to the school page. We will make sure you have that link. Um, and just keep up with us. We have more webinars being scheduled for this fall. So um, topics and dates are gonna be coming out and being posted. Um, and then you all are more than welcome to join our ambassadors group. And so that is a community of survivors, caregivers, patients that are all um, just staying connected and being that peer-to-peer -peer support for one another. And so right now they meet monthly. Um, in fact, next Tuesday night is our September get together and it's all virtual. Um, so if you're interested in that, please feel free to email me and I'm happy to connect you. And then lastly, um, we do love hearing your feedback. So in your follow-up email, you are gonna see a survey about today's session. Um, please give us your feedback. We wanna keep improving these webinars for you. Um, we want it to be helpful and supportive for you guys. So please let us know. And everyone enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.